Well, welcome to Family Church. We're so glad that you could join us online. But we would encourage that we sing together, that we enjoy this time of lifting our voices in remembrance of the goodness of the Lord. Thanks for joining us this morning. When I'm 
I'm sinking like a stone And it feels like I'm alone I worship you When I'm so scared Life seems unfair When I'm tired and lose my way And I'm feeling so ashamed I worship you You are the anchor to my soul
darkness, my God, let us see. Father, for making a way. And even when we don't see it, Lord, you are still working. And when we don't feel it, Lord, you are still working. You never stop. You don't need the rest. You never get tired. You never grow weary. 
even though we are, Lord, so much. We need you more than ever we need you. So we ask you to be a way maker in our lives, a miracle worker. And you're still keeping your promises. Lord, you're so good to us. You're touching every heart. Whether we're still in our homes watching online or whether we're in a fellowship group or, or wherever we are, joining with your people, you're working a miracle that we can't see. Help us to trust you. Help us to lay it down and know that's who you are. So Lord, we humbly submit to you, the miracle worker who loves us. Thank you, Father, for your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Welcome to our online service today. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Austin, and I just want to share with you a few announcements here at Family Church. First, we are hosting a night of worship, and that is called Illuminate. We are hosting this on September 18th, Saturday at 6 p.m. So be sure to join us. It's going to be very great as we experience God through a night of worship. You can check out more about this on our app or even on our website as well. Second, we are hosting a river baptism, and that is going to be the following day, September 19th, Sunday. And if you want to know more information about that, just fill it out on your Connect card, or you can check it out on our website and app as well to be a part of that experience. And finally, we just want to really thank you because God is really working through you and through Family Church in being able to reach more people. And so we had bought or purchased our South Umpqua building and we are looking to move into that so that we can start our services there and be able to reach more people. So we just want, really want to thank you because God is moving in amazing ways in Douglas County and it is all through you by being a part of his mission uh, by giving. And so if you want to be a part of that or learn more about how you can give, just simply uh, go to our website and you can check it out there or fill out on your connect card and we'd love to be able to connect with you to see in different ways how you can be able to be a part of God's mission in, in Douglas County and being able to reach more people. So thank you, hope you enjoy this service and let us know if we can help you in any way we can. Hello Family Church. Uh, I've been reflecting about God at work in my life personally and I was thinking of the transition that we made when we first came to Sutherland. I, uh, I'd been a youth pastor in northern Washington for five years. Uh, God had brought some wonderful fruit. There was successful youth ministry there. I had married my beautiful wife, Jan. We had uh, two children. And we felt God stirring in our heart, just a, a sense of be ready if there's going to be a move coming. And then we got a call from Bob in Sutherland. And I didn't know who Bob was, and I didn't know where Sutherland was. And uh, we made the preparations and came down here and visited with people and felt like that there was a good fit, that God was calling us. And then there's this scary moment. There's this excitement slash fear. And I remember driving down the big hill in our U-Haul truck with Megan in the, in the seat next to me and Jan in the car behind us and realizing, here we go. How is this going to go? And we'd already had some kind of struggle moments because Linden is about 60% Dutch and the, the lawns are perfect and everything's clean and everybody's very focused on appearances. And, and we drove through Sutherland and it was, it was the first shutdown because of the, the spotted owl. And let me just say it wasn't pristine. The, the storefronts are boarded up and we actually took a sneak peek at the parsonage and, and the roof had leaked and the water had gotten into the carpet. And so they had the carpet all mounted up. And we didn't know they were in a remodel process, but it just looked a lot different. And so that transition was full of excitement, fear, and there's no way to know how it's going to go. So it's this kind of foggy, blank step of faith. And of course, God has done so many, so many miracles and so many blessings in, in our life and in, in the life of Family Church. And so looking back, you go, wow, that was a great move. And and God was clearly leading, and you have all the clarity of hindsight. 
And uh, we want to celebrate this weekend. We're kind of taking a moment out from the Proverbs, even though this very clearly fits into the wisdom of Proverbs. And we want to talk about seasons. And I want you to think with me about uh, a character who was very big in the Old Testament named Moses. And he had a very specific kind of life that that obviously not only made a huge impact, but teaches us some very valued th- valuable things. Because he had... 120 years of a life divided into four equal segments of 40 years, 40 years, and 40 years. And the first 40 years, he was a king in Egypt. And the second 40 years, he was really kind of a a runaway on the backside of the desert. And the the third 40 years, he led the children of Israel out of slavery into the promised land. And so I want to kind of walk through what those seasons were like and the transitions in between and, and the First thing I want to get to your heart, and if you have your notes with you, uh, either the paper notes or the if you're following out on the app, I want you to write down God, that, that, that every season has a purpose. That God is working in our lives, and we've seen the ends and the beginnings of a lot of, of, a lot of different seasons in this last few years. And I'm sure in your life there are times when you have an ending of one season and the beginning of the next. And I don't think they're quite as clean cut as Moses were. Uh, The 40-40-40 beautiful uh, symmetry is not probably what our lives are like, but I think we can learn a lot from the stages and the transitions of Moses' life. So let's just uh, look at that, and I want you to look at not the story where it's found in the book of Exodus, but where we are going to look at it is from Acts chapter 7. And the advantage there is First of all, it's kind of cliff notes. It's really short. But it also is, instead of just kind of the newspaper report of Exodus, he's looking at it as a a documentary or a commentary on the life of Moses. And in Stephen's case, uh, he's presenting to a very powerful group of Jewish leaders named the Sanhedrin. And they want to kill him because he's a follower of Jesus. And he's trying to show them that Moses actually was a beautiful picture and a, what we call a foreshadowing of the life of Christ. So in Acts chapter 7, he, he starts with the story with just reminding them that they, the children of Israel had been in Egypt as slaves. And then he talks about the life of Moses. And in verse uh, 20, it says, at that time, Moses was born and he was no ordinary child. For three months, he was cared for by his family. And when he was placed outside, Pharaoh's daughter took him and brought him in as her own. And if you haven't read the story, I'd encourage you to read it this week. But his parents tried to hide him for a while, and they put him in a little basket, an ark, and they had his older sister watch. And and who should come down to the Nile River to bathe but the very daughter of Pharaoh himself. And so she took him, and she named him Moses, which means drawn out of the water, And she named him Moses, and she adopted him. And basically, uh, for the first 40 years of his life, he was trained to be in the courts of Pharaoh, perhaps even to be a potential for the, the one who would follow as the next Pharaoh. And the statement it makes here is really powerful at the end of it. Verse 22, it says, Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech and action. So Stephen's summary of his stage of life, of that season, was that all of that training, how to be a military leader, how to learn the the written language of the Egyptians, how to to rule a large group of people, all of that, it says he was educated in all of those things. So season one in his life was training to be a king and a leader and a deliverer. And At the end of that, it says he was powerful in speech and in action. Now, that's not the picture we have of Moses later on, but there had clearly been a lot of training that God had poured into him. And then the transition. And transitions are always rough. Transitions always have problems. And in Moses' story, he goes out at age 40 and he is walking around. Even though he's Hebrew, he is still like a a ruling Egyptian. And the Hebrew slaves are being forced to slave labor, very, very difficult slave labor. And so he sees one of the the Egyptian slave masters beating one of the Hebrews. And 
he's moved with anger and he wants to stop it. And I think in a deeper sense, he feels God has called him to be a, a, a deliverer. And so he, he's trained in combat. And so he takes that slave master and beats him and kills him and hides him in the sand. And, and the next day, he goes out again, thinking this has all been hidden and secret. And he sees two Hebrew slaves arguing and fighting each other. And he tells them to knock it off. And what are they doing? They're both Hebrews. And uh, one of them slaves says to him, are you going to kill me like you killed the Egyptian slave master yesterday? And so obviously he knows that his, his secret is out and his time there is up. But then that slave says a very, very impacting thing. In verse 27, he says, who made you ruler and judge over us? You're not my boss, <laughs> as kids say. But he's looking at him and he's saying, you think you're a ruler and judge by the way you're acting, by the way you're talking, by obviously he was reading Moses' body language. And he's saying, who made you a ruler and judge? And that precipitated uh, Moses running for his life, heading out into the desert and and he left everything behind and just escaped with his life. And so the, the next season of his life didn't start either smoothly or easily. He is out in the backside of the desert. And in that stage of life, um, there's some wonderful blessings. He, he's given a wife. Uh, he has two children, Gershom and Eliezer. And, uh, and then he also is trained to be a shepherd. He is trained in the ways of the desert. He's trained about how to find watering holes and grazing for the animals. And, and yet in his own mind, I'm pretty sure he thought he was washed up and done and no more talk of delivery, no more talk of helping the slaves in Egypt. And then he comes to another transition, and this one's very dramatic. Uh, he sees a burning bush that doesn't burn up, and he heads over to see what it is about. And, and the voice of God speaks to him out of the fire and says, take off your shoes, you're on holy ground. And the awesome power of God is available to him. And he says, God says to Moses, I want you to be a deliverer. I want you to get down to Egypt and I want you to tell Pharaoh and to tell the elders of the Hebrew people, I want you to tell them that I'm going to take them out of Egypt and I'm going to take them to a promised land. And he gives them this incredible, big, huge assignment. And this is part of the transition. Moses is completely adjusted to life in the desert. He's, he's given up on the dream. He's, he's just taking care of sheep now. And all of a sudden God says, oh no, the dream was accurate. Your timing was wrong and your method was wrong. But that is what I've called you to do. And so now Moses, in his inadequacy, he says, I can't do it. There's no way. I, I am not that kind of guy. I'm, I'm a loser. And so God gives him some very specific signs because his question to God is, who will I tell them sent me? You see, he's really answering the question that that Hebrew slave said, who made you our delivery and judge, or deliverer and judge? And so Moses says to God, who shall I say sent me? And God gives him the covenant name of God, of Yahweh. And then he shows him, he says, here's some signs that I am sending you. And he throws his rod down and it turns into a snake and he picks it up and it becomes a staff again. And he puts his hand inside of his cloak and he comes it out, brings it out and it's full of leprosy, the most fearful disease of the, of the era. And then he says, put it back in again and bring it out and it's made whole and clean. And, and he gives him another sign. He says, when you get to Egypt... If they don't believe you, take some water of the Nile and pour it out on that will turn it into blood. And so God gives him all of this encouragement and buttressing. And, and, and ironically, Moses' picture of himself at that point is, but God, I can't do it. And his final excuse is, I, I, I can't talk very well. The man who was called powerful in speech and action now says, I can't even speak adequately. And God gives him training wheels of his brother Aaron but he sends him into the third season of his life. And in the third season of his life, Moses is exactly what God had called him to be. He's a deliverer and he's the, their judge. He confronts Pharaoh. He confronts the leaders of the, the, the elders of Israel. He confronts the Red Sea and the army of Pharaoh. He confronts the, the 
desert and the lack of water and lack of food. And, and he confronts God himself at Mount Sinai. And he leads his people for 40 years through really, really difficult times, but really exciting times as well as God shows up again and again and again. And finally, he comes to the end of his life. And in fact, he has been made the ruler and judge that will be known forever as the one who brought the children of Israel out of slavery and out of Egypt. So you look at those plans and you see that the first 40 years, God set him up to learn and to grow and to, to find out about Egypt and all of the, the intricacies of being a military leader. And then the, the second section was to, how to shepherd sheep and care for them in the middle of a desert in often very challenging circumstances. And then the third season, those lessons from the first two began to really be fleshed out. And he learned how to follow God intimately and not only rely on his stages from before, but to learn what God was, to, was teaching him and, and leading him to do. And so whatever season you are in your life, I want you to really believe that every season has a purpose, that God has a plan for you in this time frame. And transitions are difficult. That, that's the second thing I want to get to your heart is that every transition has problems. Every season has purpose. Every transition has problems. And we can see that and learn that in the life of Moses as well. But I also have a friend who's going through a transition right now. And I'd like to invite Pastor Will to come up and just share a little bit about how he empathizes with the story of Moses now that he's in a season of transition in his own life. Uh, it's funny how uh, you may read a story hundreds of times, and uh, every time you read it, there's always something new that you see, especially when you find yourself in a transition or in some in some new space yourself. And uh, when we were talking about transitions personally, and then we were talking about the story of Moses, yeah, this uh, this reading of it this time in my life at age 42, uh, it means something different. Mm -hmm. Um, specifically, there was one part of it that I really resonated with me, it had to do with when Moses leaves Egypt. And I think that there's a real temptation um, to, do, uh, to do speed read because you know the end of the story. And to think of the most famous moments of Moses' life are probably the burning bush. And then like what we see on the movies with Charlton Heston where he stands before Pharaoh and says, let my people go and those kinds of moments. And I think if you just look at highlights, you miss out on some deeply profound things that happen. And so I want you just to pause for a moment and back up. Go from that moment where he is 40 and he has killed someone. It's been found out and now he needs to leave. And instead of just racing from living in Egypt to living in Midian and being a foreigner in both places and those components, I want you to imagine what did it feel like for Moses one mile outside of the border of Egypt. Mm -hmm. So he's one mile out. And there's just some things that, that I notice in there um, that have been helpful for me. Some of you are in moments of transition and you're in transition because of the state of everything that's going on. Some of you feel like you're in constant transition because of the nature of where our world is right now with the pandemic and with just society working through that. Um, but one of the things that also it would be, might be helpful for you, you may not be walking through a stage. It could be the friend sitting next to you um, that is in need of some empathy. And uh, perhaps looking at Moses' life will be helpful in that. And so there's this specific part where I picture him one mile out and, and a couple things that I noticed that he's lost. And I think it's, it's great to acknowledge what he's losing because anytime you're, you're moving to a different uh, stage, there's a transition out of something. It's out of, meaning it's not coming with you. It's different. And one of the first things that I noticed that um, Moses loses is he loses his position. He had authority. He did have power. And I like how that the guy goes, uh, who made you? Well, officially nobody, but he does have a lot of authority. He, he's from Pharaoh's house. And so there is some position. There is some recognition. That, oh, yeah, don't mess with that guy. He had, he had some semblance of a position. And as the, the place that I'm in right now, I know what it's like to have once had a position and know that at this moment right now it is ending. And there is a loss there. What, what, what was true in 2014 and what was true in 2016 and 2012, it's not true now. I am not a pastor at Family Church. Well, I am for like, I got, I got like six more minutes. But as a whole, that entire thing is not what it was. And so 
I think there's a, an acknowledgement that needs to happen and, and maybe even some grief. Now, there may be some great things that God's going to do down the road, but right now, this just hurts because what I am now is not what I have been. And so I think there's some acknowledgement in that. And uh, just a piece of advice, when you are sitting with someone who is in the middle of transition and they say what they're losing, don't try and butter them up or don't try and um, soften it by saying, well, God's got, just let it hurt because it does hurt. Um, and sometimes talking about what the future holds, which will be important, may not be what they need at that moment. The other thing that I noticed in Moses' life in this uh, that happens, and I had not, because I love this, I don't know how many hundreds of times I've heard the story, he preached or read the story of Moses, but Paul brought it up this time looking at the, the sermon that Stephen gives. It says that he, when he left, can you read it again? He was what? Describe him as a communicator. He was powerful in speech and action. He is the guy you want on the teaching team. Yep. And yet when you ask, now how would you describe Moses as a communicator? We often remember what he is at age 80, which was that he was slow of speech. In fact, God had to send Aaron to go be the first communicator. And at the beginning of his interactions with Pharaoh, Aaron is the one that speaks. And it takes about two times and then Moses takes over and he's fine. But what I never realized was 40 years earlier, the description of him as a communicator was powerful. That's amazing. And here's what I want you to notice, that sometimes when you go into the desert, there may be stages where you lose confidence. And I believe that Moses lost confidence. And as I've reflected on that in me, I know that there will be a lot of confidence that's shaken. And hopefully it's shaken in the right way. Because here's what I've noticed, that being humbled can often be humiliating. And I, you know that I am stepping off the team partly because I see a pride issue in my life and I want humility to reign. Um, that often means that some of the confidence I once had in things that I could do won't be there. And I think that's just worth acknowledging that Moses was humbled in the desert. And then the third one's probably the most emotional one is that when you go through stages of transition, you will lose relationships. And that's just the reality of it. And uh, feeling the weight of that myself right now, uh, as I am looking at now I'm down to minutes as a pastor at part of Family Church, that those relationships that uh, have been the way that they are won't, won't be that way anymore. And Paul and I, you and I will still be friends, but 14 years of working together is different than whatever it will be. It will be different. Um, for 19 years, you have been my pastor and you won't be that anymore. And so just coming to the realization and, and being honest about it, there's grief in that. So picture Moses with dusty feet and dirt all over him and he's walking out in the desert and he's probably a little scared too. Acknowledge what he's lost. It won't be long. Well, yeah, I guess it will be long. But in 40 years, he's going to come across a bush in the desert and all of those things that he's lost, God's going to use and come back around and there will be some amazing things that happens. Um, did you want me to share kind of where I'm well, I, I was thinking we're, what we're trying to balance today, which is really key, is the empathy, the, the struggle of transitions is real and hard. And, and yet the other side of it is beautiful and exciting and wonderful. And I think that's great advice. Sometimes we have the Christian words without the heart of empathy that says, oh, it'll be good. You know, Romans 8, 28, God's going to make everything work together for good. And, and then you punch the person. Yeah. It's like, that's how it feels. Yeah. You just want to slap people because they're not caring for you in the process. And, and I think that, that is important to, to, as you said, to feel it and to experience it and to, and to be honest about it. But I, I was thinking how transition became a very powerful word in my life is when my wife had a baby the first time. And, uh, you know, that stage where you're done with all the labor and you're starting to push towards having a baby and they call it transition. And man, there is no part of that that is fun. Everybody in the room loses their sense of humor, let me say. Um, did you try and say something funny? I did not. Ah, uh, well done, Paul. I was careful. Some of you write that down. That's some good wisdom right there. But at the end of that is a baby and a life. And it's such, and I think that is a picture of the pain of the transition leads towards the, the promise of what God is going to do next. And so I know that it's helpful for us as we are empathizing with you to know that God is already starting to open up some things. So what, what are you doing next? Uh, yeah, there's such an interesting um, aspect of this. I love that Moses is walking out into the desert 
Because the way it felt for us is that we were more like Abraham, who when he was called by God, he was called out essentially into a similar desert. And he was just told, just go, and I'll tell you later what you're going to do. Don't call me, we'll call you. Right. So Abraham heads out into the desert without any knowledge of where he's going. And that really resonated with us because when we um, announced to you on August 1st that it was time for us to, to move away from family church, we had no plans. The, the, the two biggest questions were why and where are you going? And I could tell you why. I could tell you what was going on inside of me. But where we were going, we didn't know. And that was a little bit of a surprise for some people because oftentimes when a pastor leaves, it's because something bigger and better or some church from somewhere calls. But that in some ways would have been easier, would have been a lot easier actually, if we had a place where we were going, but we didn't. Um, so it wasn't until about a week and a half ago uh, that I kind of stumbled into an interview, which led to another interview, which led to a job. And so I will be a children's, uh, hold on. CDS. Yeah, I know, I know the, the letters. Children's Development Specialist. Yeah, I forgot what I was. <laughs> See, I'm so fresh at it, I don't know what the letters stand for. A CDS at Eastwood Elementary, a child development specialist, where essentially I help them walk with empathy. I help them learn what their own emotions are and then how to interact with each other. Um, so I get uh, to teach three classes a day and then I get to play at recess a lot, which is, I mean, come on. What could be better? <laughs> it fits you perfectly. It does. And... Uh, and it's encouraging for us to see as we are walking with you in this journey that God is already, and even the way your interview came about and all of that, God clearly had his hand in it. And I think it's well suited for you. And I believe that God will continue to work in you and to work through you in that setting. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just want to pause. We're going to do this in the, the service in the park this weekend, but we just want to pause with those of you who are watching online. And, and I want to, first of all, just say personally, how much you've meant to me. And as you say, we were friends before you were a pastor with me, but um, you have added tremendously to my life and specifically to speaking skills and to asking me good questions and challenging me and being the good example of somebody who listens to truth and changes their life to fit with it. And, and uh, I just want to say what a privilege it's been. And on behalf of Family Church, thank you for all the ways in which we are different because you've been here and those things will continue and God will take you in a different track and he's going to work in you and through you. But he's also given us precious gifts through you and your family. And we just want to say thanks. And we want to just pray for you and send you out to that. Thank you. Father, I thank you for Will and Crystal and for how, what a privilege it's been to watch their lives develop in your mighty power and your plan. And I know that, that quite often the, the road ahead looks foggy to us. And transitions are filled with not only painful moments, but of big questions. And I thank you that you've provided already for, for Will, for employment for another season, and for some clarity in his own heart about what it is you want to develop in him. And I pray for he and Crystal, and Lord, also for Anna and Anderson, as they, as they process this, that you would help them through the painful part of the transition to the, the glorious part of the next season and how... What he's learned here at Family Church will go with him, and what he's left here at Family Church will stay with us. And that, God, we can trust you because you always know what you're doing. And even though we are often only very, very partially aware of it, um, we see with eyes of faith that you are doing great things. So thank you, God, for Will and for Crystal, and thank you for the fact that we can trust you to lead us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, brother. Thank you. And so that kind of cements what we were talking about for the third part, and that's that God always has a plan, that every season has a purpose, and that every transition has its problems, and that God always has a plan. And so I think of that picture of transition in a birth, and how then you get a baby out of it. And, and when the baby comes and when the excitement of a new life comes, uh, the remembrance of the difficulty of the transition fades away. And so that remembering that God has a purpose and a plan also moves us to another reason we're celebrating this weekend. Um, we are celebrating what Will and Crystal have given to us and that God is moving them to their next season. And we're also celebrating for South Umpqua. And the, the struggle and the process of 
getting a, uh, a campus established there, uh, we already knew that it was going to be a difficult area to set up a campus in. And, and at first we set up in the school and Sky and Jody were there in leadership. And, and over a period of time, uh, because of COVID, first of all, we were denied using the school. And so they set up in an office and then God called Sky and Jody to a, a different season as well. And so then it was, the campus was left without, without uh, a campus pastor. And then Jason and Shaughnessy have stepped in there and have done a wonderful relational job of connecting with people. And, and now as we move forward, um, even though we've been looking for a building for both Green Campus and for South Umpqua, there seemed to be nothing available in this time when building costs are so high and, and buildings so unavailable. God has given us a building that is a, an excellent price and we still clearly need to do some, some repairs and some updating of it, but it's a usable building and uh, God has provided that for us. And I think of the, the very graphic picture of a butterfly. And I don't know if you heard the story of a, of a little kid that got a hold of a chrysalis and they saw that a, a butterfly was struggling to try to get out of that chrysalis, out of the cocoon. And, and so he tore it open so that that butterfly could escape. And what he didn't know was that the transition and the difficulty of the transition was a foundation for the beauty that would come next. Because what happens, and it's a really cool biological fact, that, that the wings of the butterfly actually have tubes in them that have to be filled up. And, and when that butterfly presses through the chrysalis, the fluid is actually forced down into the wings. And it's, it's a, a special fluid called the homolymph. And it inflates the wings. And then the butterfly has to climb outside and let the wings hang down so the rest of the fluid can go to the very end of the wings. And then as it dries, then that not only the beauty of the butterfly comes out, but the ability to fly. So think about this. The difficulty of the transition is the foundation for the beauty of the flight. And that the, the time that was needed to get out of that chrysalis can't be shortcut. It can't be taken away because otherwise the butterfly ends up always walking and never flying. Somehow they can live, but they are always handicapped. And I want you to think about your own place in life. If you're going through a season and we've all seen a lot of loss and difficulties in the season, and I, I want you to see with eyes of faith that, that the foundation of this whole idea of seasons in our life is that God is continually adding. Sometimes we have no idea. In my own life, I, I always had a fascination with the Spanish language, and I, I took it in junior high, and I took it in high school, and I took it in college, and, and actually learned where I could speak Spanish to some degree, and, and then I never used it for about 15 years. And then we started taking mission trips to Mexico. And it was those things that all of a sudden brought the things that I'd learned 20 years before into need. And boy, was I rusty and I had to learn it again quickly. And, and I got the privilege of starting to teach uh, Todd Fink, who now is a missionary down in, in the Baja in, in Mexico. And you begin to see how God puts pieces in your life and takes pieces out of your life because he's building something beautiful. And so even though this may be a, a, a seemingly heavy topic, what we're really celebrating today is that God has a purpose for every season. And that even though every transition has its problems, that God always has a plan. And so we are celebrating today the building that he's given to us and the, what that means for the South Umpqua campus and what that means for us being an ongoing lighthouse in a, in a tough location so that Jesus Christ can shine out to others. And I want you just to re-look at your life you know, when we talk about giving messages, we talk about exegeting the scripture. Exegete means to give a critical interpretive explanation of it. And we also have to exegete our culture and look around us and to see what's going on in America today and how do we need to apply the scriptures to exactly where we need it. And I would add one more to that. We need to learn to exegete our life. We need to look at our stages and seasons and transitions and, and the process that God takes us through. And we need to have a critical interpretation of it in light, through eyes of faith to believe that God is working, that he knows what he's doing, 
And that if I surrender to him, if I cooperate with the process, if I learn everything that I can, and that's obviously one of the, one of the lessons of, of the verse that you learned this last week. The beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom. And part of wisdom is exegeting your life with the eyes of faith and trusting that God is going to do great things. And we believe that and we step forward confidently in faith, not in confidence in ourselves like Moses had to start with. But when he came down, in fact, I, I, I want you to, to see, and I didn't finish this verse in chapter 7. It says in verse 35, This is the same Moses they had rejected with the words, Who made you ruler and judge? And he was sent to be their ruler and deliverer by God himself. That answered the question. Who made the ruler and judge? God did. And I go now in the third stage of his life, not in his own confidence, but in the confidence of Almighty God. So I hope this is an encouragement to you, as well as being empathetic for the fact that transition is tough, but God always knows what he's doing. So keep believing that. Keep exegeting your life in light of God's word. Thanks for joining us. God bless. <laughs>